Dominic Waddles. And I'm Mark Rosenblatt. And this is the M Detroit Podcast. Here at M Detroit, we interview the artists of Detroit by discussing their lives, their art, and many other topics. In doing this, we hope to create a platform for artists to share their work. On today's podcast, we have the wonderful Chris Johnson. We talk about wearing different hats of a working musician, composer, and arranger. We talk about him playing with the Count Basie Orchestra. Then we go forth to talking on life lessons learned by playing music in Detroit. It's so much more. So without further ado, please enjoy Chris Johnson. Well, welcome to the In Detroit Podcast. You are the first podcast that we're recording for season three. Oh, dope. Okay. And right. um, we couldn't be any more thankful for you being on our podcast. And we hope to shed more good news about the Detroit area and Detroit artists and what they're talking about and what they're doing. Because clearly everybody has, or most everybody has seen your videos and you influence a lot of people, such as our professors like Vincent Chandler and... Um, and our peers. And our you know, peers, you know, so many people are like, "Oh yeah, I had Chris Johnson as I was as practicing my, his tips. his his uh <laughs> his my director at Civic." <laughs> that's still wild to hear, man. Like, because I still remember being a student, you know. Like, yeah, <laughs> it, so it's wild to hear that. Like, oh yeah, yeah, I remember you. You work with you know, but man, there's a lot. It's really crazy because even in the band, there's like several people that I taught at some point, and now mm-hmm. we're working side by side. I mean, that's that's what it's supposed to be, though. Yeah, no, absolutely. And then like. We saw, uh, while we were doing research for your podcast, we saw, uh, you posted a picture on Instagram of you in Civic with Marcus Belgrave and a bunch of people that were also, you know, like your age group. And that was like really interesting to see. Oh Um, man. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like that. We're talking 20 years ago now. Right. 20 years? A little little over 20 years ago. I'm old, man. Listen. Yeah, nah, (laughs) nah, 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 nah. I'm old enough. All right, how about right, that? right. I mean, <laughs> you don't uh, look it. You, you look don't. so young. Yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, I'm 37, so I, I'm not like terribly old, but I'm not young anymore. Let's, uh, let's not let's not get it twisted. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I embrace it. I actually love it. I love the uh, I love the development. I love the continuation. Yeah. I love being that mentor figure for people in this community that I so desperately needed and that I benefited so much from. So I'm happy, and I'm still. Still in touch with my mentors, still benefiting from, you know, the the wisdom of my mentors. So mm-hmm. it's dope. Yeah. Mm. Well, the way that we um, start this podcast is we uh, read you your bio that um, we find in various places. Occasionally we have to uh, put one together or write one ourselves. Uh, in this case, um, you did the job for us and we pulled this one from your website um, I try to keep it updated. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um, so after we're uh, done reading you your bio, then we're going to ask you a couple of questions about it. So here goes, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Chris Johnson is an award-winning trumpeter, composer, and educator. He has appeared on five Grammy-nominated albums and composed the original score for the four-time Emmy-nominated web series King Esther. Chris toured the world as a trumpeter and arranger with the Count Basie Orchestra from 2008 to 2019 and served as the director of jazz studies at the University of Utah from 2015 to 2019. Woo. Currently, Chris is a freelance composer, arranger, and educator in Metro Detroit and the creator and curator of the online education series Office Hours with Chris Johnson. Mr. Johnson has performed at some of the world's most prestigious jazz venues, including the Apollo Theater, the Blue Note Jazz Club, U.S. and Japan, Sydney Opera House, Blues Alley, and the Hollywood Bowl. He has also had the opportunity to perform with many jazz greats, including Tony Bennett, Patty Austin, Wes Anderson, Wycliffe Jordan, John Hendricks, Monty Alexander, Christian McBride, Jamie Cullum, and many others. Chris received his master's in 2007 and bachelor's in 2005 in jazz studies from Michigan State University. He was a full-time faculty member at the Ohio State University from 
2012 to 2015 as a jazz lecturer. He is also the former director of Detroit Symphony's Civic Jazz Orchestra, where he held the most talented students, or he, he led the most talented students in Metro Detroit. Johnson has also served as a jazz artist in residence at Troy High School, Southfield Lathrop High School, Eaton Rapids High School, and is the composer and creator of The Learning Experience, a series of workshops that use hip-hop and jazz to teach elementary students about science, reading, and math. And for the rest of the listeners, we kind of uh, cut and paste some of Chris's bio, not the whole thing. So if you want to get the full entire bio, make sure you check out Chris Johnson's website, and we'll definitely link that and have Chris um, uh, mention any other p- things to check out at the end of the podcast. Um, so yeah, there there's your bio. Um, huh. So what we what we <laughs> like to do, <laughs> and Chris is like, I already knew that. <laughs> but no, but uh, it was nice hearing it back, though, man. You read it, you know. I was like, man, I feel accomplished, man. That was, <laughs> was not nice. feel accomplished. Yeah. Um, but yeah. so hearing your bio, is there anything that you would add or you would change that might not necessarily be in the bio right now? <laughs> if using my response to that would be, if you want more information, I'll send you my CV, which has like a lot more detailed information. Um but no, that's, I think that's a good highlights reel, for sure. Uh, I will say I have not updated my bio since I started the Chris Johnson Big Band. So at some point, I should probably add on there uh, just what the Chris Johnson Big Band has accomplished you know, during this, uh, this, this tragic year of 2020 and what we're going to continue to do during 2021 until we can meet in person. Um, I'm very, very proud of the work. Uh, that I've done through social media and the releases um, during this time and, you know, being able to be productive. Um, so that's probably the only thing I would add. And now you guys are inspiring me to go through and add that. So Yeah, <laughs> I like it. Can you tell us a little bit about um, some of the things you've been able to accomplish with the big band? Yeah, for sure. So the Chris Johnson big band was started um, kind of out of boredom, uh, but I swear I always had it in my mind that I wanted to start a big band. Mm-hmm. I played with the Basie Orchestra, as you know, and, you know, wrote, had a chance to write some arrangements, um, both, you know, on tour as well as on some recordings. But it was very much so like in the Basie vein, which I love. And this is definitely a large part of who I am. But I've got like my own musical voice, which is almost like polar opposite when you listen to any of the Chris Johnson group albums. So I was like, man, it'd be dope to like capture the spirit of the Chris Johnson group, but put that into big band format. But you know, other projects took precedence, uh, other gigs, opportunities, whatever. So we got hit and all of a sudden everything just slowed down with the pandemic. Right. And so I reached out to, uh, you know, the core musicians in the Chris Johnson group was like, are you guys down to add a couple more people and do a, a big band rendition of my, uh, my arrangement of yes or no by Wayne Shorter. And everybody was down. Of course, I recorded all four trumpet parts, uh, Christian Foreman, a uh, form, you know, a current student of mine, laid all the trombone parts down. Marcus Elliott split, I think like alto two and tenor one. Uh, Sean Thunder Wallace did tenor two and Barry, Caleb Curtis joined us on alto. I mean, it was, it was like, it was, it was dope. We put it together. Everybody loved it. So from there I'm like, okay, let's make this a thing because people really responded to it and not just like a, Oh, this is dope, but more like a, this is something that we need more of. And I missed this. Even in just the short time that it had been, we missed being able to see this, and it felt like an immersive experience. So, um, and and through the process, I learned how to video edit that type of thing. I had no idea what I was doing prior to that. Um, I just done some educational videos, but I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna frame it together and, and figure out a way to make it work. And since then, I'm I think we're on our. I'm currently working on a, a special uh, project that I can't talk about yet, but it's actually the either the 13th or 14th installment of the chris johnson big band um in terms of like full-on arrangements uh and, and videos and we've had a couple of commissions um from kamal kenyatta who became a huge fan of the band has always been a close friend and mentor but i've gotten even closer to him closer to him through this process because he commissioned the band to write uh, arrangements of his songs uh, peter cobia destiny and watching and waiting gotcha and uh 
yeah, we did some Christmas stuff with Antoine Stanley. Uh, my yeah. fiance and I collabed with uh, with the uh, the song "Torn," <laughs> which she she sung vocals on, and we've just been having a really good time using different musicians. You know, of course, I have my core group, but bringing in different musicians, different guest musicians, and just trying to make music and make people feel good and mm-hmm. and like make dope art. That's like the whole vibe. Yeah, yeah, we really enjoy. Or I know I really enjoyed the one where you had. Uh, Sean Jones on trumpet. I was just like, "What? <laughs> <laughs> it's so cool!" But um, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, um, man, that was God. Yeah. That was fun. That was really fun. I mean, of course, I set myself up. I was like, "Oh man, it'd be great to feature like Melvin Jones and Sean Jones and Derek Gardner." And I guess myself. Oh man, I gotta play by these cats. So I took the first solo, so I could get myself out the way. <laughs> <laughs> and they could just go crazy. <laughs> no nah, man, it was a really beautiful experience having them for sure. Those are like my big brothers. Mm-hmm. You know? Right. So um. I know you've uh, you've done a lot of score film work, so can you talk about that process and actually uh, how you go about writing either themes or stuff for show series and all all, all that? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, I have been into film scoring ever since I saw Mo Better Blues when I was in high school, and I started mm. getting obsessed with Spike Lee films, which meant I ended up getting obsessed with Terrence Blanchard and also with uh, Spike Lee's father, Bill Lee. And the scores that you know um, that Bill Lee provided early on in Spike's career, and then all the scores that Terrence did after, and Terrence Blanchard just became like like this like idol figure of like career goals. That's that's what I want. <laughs> I want to do the things that Terrence Blanchard is doing. He has a dope band. Check, great. He's scoring films. That's great. Now he's like writing operas and stuff. Like that's the that's the goat right there all day. Um, great, great guy. Very Good. supportive. Just amazing human. Um, but yeah, I started scoring for film and I, you know, it, it's it's one of the awkward things where everyone wants you to have experience, even to do a free project. Everybody wants you to have experience, but nobody will give you that experience unless you have experience. So I went, I mean, after grad school, I'd say like for a good solid year, year and a half, there was this website called Mandy.com. I think it still exists, but it was basically kind of like a classifieds for like filmmakers seeking musicians or musicians to promote themselves or for you know actors and grips and all anything in the film world and i would just go on and just like contact all these different student filmmakers and be like i'm a composer here's some of my jazz stuff i want to write for your 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 film for free i'm offering myself for free and nobody would bite because like i didn't have any examples of what my music to film sounded and looked like Mm -hmm. finally there was a comedic web series that fell in love with my music thank god um my good friend lisa robinson um she had a web series called the punani diaries hilarious i think it's probably still on youtube somewhere but we're talking like this is like 2008 ish 2008 2009 just incredible web series absolutely hilarious but uh basically she gave me a shot even though i didn't have anything to show and i scored quite a few episodes for them um again we were all doing it pro bono just to get our work out there and uh i just started researching like what's the process i was reading a couple of you know blogs and things about film scoring uh and just figured out a process so for me the first thing i do is i, I just try to watch several times the entire project and just like fall in love with the characters and and get to know like what's happening with the story understand like the arc right Right. Then from there, I'm dissecting that into okay, where should where does this need music? Where does this not need music? And I start taking notes from there. And then really I just start breaking the film down. I just break it down into sections and um really break it down into separate cues. I actually create like a unique file uh, specifically for each part of the music. And I'm watching it and I'm thinking about the characters. I'm thinking about themes for the characters. I'm also thinking about like an overall sound. I'll usually like design a drum kit or like have like a a very specific piano patch or like you know different textures that i want to use and then it's really just about supporting the story you know it's really about like how does this scene play into the entire episode okay great how does this musical theme carry us through the entire episode how do all these things relate to the series as a whole and start making those decisions and allowing myself to react to the you know to the film and really it's not so much like it's never ooh look at me i'm a composer it's like i don't know almost like i'm a really important extra 
that you see in most of the scenes. It's like in the background somewhere, just mm. kind of like creeping out, just kind of like looking like, oh, it's the main character. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> yeah. like people enjoy seeing you in the background. Like you guys watch uh, Chappelle show. Yes. Remember there was like, remember there was the dude, like there was like a, a, a series where he kept having this dude in the back, just like doing the robot, just like doing his thing in the back. Right. Yeah. And you f- like fell in love with this. Like, like, why is this dude doing the robot? But it was in every episode and they never talked about it. To me, like, I kind of want to be that musically sometimes. I want to be that thing that, like, supports it or, like, makes you feel something, but it's not taking the attention, except for in the moment of, like, a big montage or, like, you know, like a big dramatic moment where there's no dialogue. But for the most part, man, I'm, like, a very uh, important supporting extra (laughs) that's in the background. (laughs) Yeah. And I'm constantly studying it, man. You know, I'm constantly, like, looking at uh, interviews of Hans Zimmer and... Terrence Blanchard and uh, Ludwig Garrison and like all these greats and just like I like I subscribed to Masterclass just so I could watch Hans Zimmer's Masterclass I'm I'm working through that now then I'm gonna move on to Danny Elfman's and just study it like anything else man those are like the the movie equivalents of of Miles Davis and Charlie Parker and Louis Armstrong you know you get to know like what that is and how they approach storytelling but then also it's cool to have your own approach. Um, mm-hmm. So I just try to take all that in. I'm, and I love, I'm always watching TV shows and movies and all that. And I'm enjoying it, but I'm also studying. Um, plus, it also helps that my, my fiance is an actress, like a dope actress. So um, we're very dramatic and we're always like, we're studying. We're like studying the acting and how the music <laughs> come in here. Oh man, listen to that piano <laughs> patch. And then forgetting about the storyline for a minute. But to me, that's key. It's like a, it's a constant presence in my life, you know? That's awesome. Mm-hmm. I, I dig that. I, uh, I'm, uh, I'm curious, like, do you always, do you have to like change your, the way that you watch a movie or are you just always in like study mode where you're like, you watch a movie and you're just like, oh man, I got to remember that. Or is there any time where you can just be like, I'm just going to watch this movie without any of that, <laughs> without <laughs> thinking about anything? I think... I say that any musician, when they listen to music, they're they're studying it and enjoying it at the same time. To right. me, they're not like um, they're not separate. It's like I'm gonna I'm gonna enjoy the living daylights out of this, and I'm gonna enjoy like what I can learn from this as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's not like it's not like it's super technical. It's not like oh, I think that was you know the the dominant and it went to the secondary dominant of the fifth. Like it's nothing like that. <laughs> yeah, it's more so just kind of like that right there the way that like the strings like crept in right Mm -hmm. there and it was only the cellos man when that violin came in with the tremolo oh man it made such you like i'm thinking about stuff like that of like impact and story and like vibe and connection um so i still enjoy it a lot sure (laughs) very much so so kind of moving on uh we mentioned in your bio the amount of things that you've done you know you're you're a professor, you're a performer, you're a film composer, you're a, you're a big, band, uh, big band musician. How does that, um, how do you kind of go about s- maybe switching, but also kind of just being able to wear all those hats and be able to do all of those things kind of at the same time? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a hard one because balance is something that um, I get myself in trouble with. I used to get myself in trouble with that I've, I am very proud of the balance that I have in my life now. When I was traveling a lot, like, I got to say that, like, there's a benefit to how I did things, but it was also very complicated. Uh Uh-oh, computer, don't go to sleep because you're recording and uh, you don't want to stop recording. Okay, I didn't stop recording. That's dope. Sorry. Um, so I spent, just consider the context of I spent from 2013 up until summer 2019. I was, for part of that time, I was at Ohio State and commuting back and forth from Ohio State to Detroit, um, doing work with Detroit Symphony Orchestra Youth Ensembles, and I'm a father. And so, like, having my kids when I was here and like traveling back and forth and touring with the Basie Orchestra. Then I left Ohio State and I was like, why don't I go further? Because, you know, I don't know why I did that to myself. Except, no, it was a great opportunity. I went all all the way out to 
Salt Lake City, Utah. I was director of jazz studies at the University of Utah. Great opportunity, tenure track position, got to really make some impact. Um, but I was traveling. Every, like, two weekends out of the month, I was traveling back to Michigan to be with my kids. I was um, touring all the other weekends. I'd always joke, if there was one weekend that I spent in Utah, it was like a shock to everybody. I'd say once every, like, two or three months, I'd spend a weekend in Utah. I was either in Michigan or I was on tour or I was visiting my fiance, then girlfriend, in New York. Mm-hmm. On top of that, being a father. On top of that, being a composer. On top of that, running a department, putting out albums, all this stuff. So I guess the thing is, like, none of it's optional like all of it is stuff that i have to get out all of it's like you know do you have a choice it's like no i'm you know i'm gonna raise my kids okay like so i'm gonna fly every other weekend that's what i had to do at that time uh i'm gonna you know like spend time in new york which is musically artistically great but i'm gonna spend time with my girlfriend too Uh, okay that's great i'm gonna tour because it's the Count Basie Orchestra. Wonderful. I'm going to do that. Oh, yeah, I'm going to do my job because, you know, I'm a very hardworking <laughs> person. I'm not going to lay anybody down. So I, like, killed the job. Great. I was, I was, you know, I felt really good about the stuff that I did in that role. So I guess in terms of balance, it's really just kind of like a, how do you achieve, like, maximum output? And I think one of the ways is you go through seasons of aggressively going after the things that matter to you. And if it matters to you, then you're going to develop it and it's going to like, it's going to be great. And if you care enough, but the thing is, there were periods of times where I sacrificed sleep. There were periods of time where I sacrificed my own personal health. And I'm not saying like everybody go do those things, but it was kind of like at that time, it was, I felt like it was necessary and I benefited from it. But there were also struggles that came with that. There were consequences of not taking care of certain things. But over time, as, you know, right now, the stuff that I'm balancing literally feels like nothing in comparison to what I did for, like, you know, for that six-year period of time where I was just hustling ridiculously Mm. hard. I'm not touring right now. Even before the pandemic, I stopped touring. Uh, I'm with my kids 50% of the time. I live, you know... they live their their mom's house is 15 minutes away from here so we're seeing each other all the time and i have 50 50 custody of them so helping them with school and doing all the, the dad things i'm at my desk most of the time composing music i have got my travel bug out so i'm good this hustle is busy and there's a lot of output but it's there's no comparison to like being on a plane several times a week um mm-hmm. i don't know if i answered your question but basically you hustle <laughs> you prioritize and if you feel called to do those things like do them and Mm -hmm. i will say that you know after a certain age (laughs) things start to slow down and your priorities shift go with those seasons go with that flow um you know there might be certain seasons where i'm like all i want to do is improve on the trumpet other ones are like all i want to do is write music other ones are all i want to do is pursue film and then other times where i haven't done a film in, in months and so all i want to do is big band videos for a long time, I was like, I want to do big band videos and looping. And that's what I did. And then it switched and it was like, uh, you know, educational programs and things like that. So allow yourself to go with those seasons and follow your passion and the discipline will come. But learn from my mistake in the sense of try to find as much balance as possible as early as possible, but also know that you will have to make sacrifices. You will have times where you burn out a little bit. You don't have to freak out about it. Just adjust accordingly. Would you say that um, that hustle is something that uh, kind of you feel that people should have, like that kind of period, which you just mentioned to, you know, like maybe get to the place where you are now, where you have the ability to be like, you know, I can pick and choose exactly what I want to work on when I want to work on it and I'm more flexible or would you say that, you know, that's not necessary and there, there, there could be a different way. I think every person has a very unique path and and with art, I think it's really dangerous to try to line everybody up to be on the same path. Yeah. It's it's one of the things that I struggle with in academia, you know, Mm Mm-hmm is this idea that everybody's on the same track and that's just like 
complete bullshit. Sorry, I don't know. Do you swear on this podcast? That's all right. You're you know? fine. We okay. check the no kids <laughs> box all the time. <laughs> okay. All right. Great. Well, <laughs> I mean, that's just like, that's just like, there are certain universal skills that everybody needs to know. And I think we can, there's a lot of things you can gain from school in that way. But it's not the same path. Not every trumpet player should listen to all the same trumpet players. They should be aware of who they are. But you should also like learn the people that you like. You should study the things that you like. You should be aware of everything. There's no excuse for being ignorant. But in terms of like what you study and what you grab onto. So I know quite a few musicians who like are never stressed out. Who are working hard, but it's not like a, a hustle like that. Like a, you know, Gary V type hustle. It's just like a... A lifestyle but then i know other people who are just constantly just like ridiculous amount of output it's everything in between i'm not here to 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 shame one lifestyle or promote one lifestyle or the other i think you have to go with what's natural but every artist every human has to form has to form a, a discipline around their art and um i learned this a lot like there's a lot of therapy principles principles that I've learned from, from being in therapy um, mm -hmm. of treating what you do as a practice. And I love that. I love thinking about like self care or musicianship as a practice of something that you are working towards. It's not like, and I don't have this figured out. I am not perfect in this, but there are key things that I figured out that I feel really good about. And there are other ways that I'm still trying to develop and, and grow. So it's a practice. I wake up every day and I'm working towards something the same way we would with our scales. It's not like you play your scales and they're perfect. No, you practice them until they get as solid as possible. So that's what I feel like I'm trying to accomplish. And, and what I'm doing every day is just showing up and doing the work. And some days that might mean that I need to rest more. Some days that might mean I, meet, I need to push more. I feel called to. Um, you kind of figure that out. I will say early on, if you're able to figure out the discipline piece, not necessarily the hustle piece, right away but the discipline piece and then throw some hustle behind that then you'll be far better off uh the the early investments that i made into myself in terms of time that a lot of my peers um you know were invested in very different things the things that i invested in early on and the things that i focused my time on have really paid off in my career and i'm very very thankful for that but that's my particular path but yeah there's a hustle there for sure Man, you are you, you, every single word that comes out of your mouth is just so inspiring. Like, oh, <laughs> I'm just a 21 over here. I'm just like, oh, I I get the joy of hearing so much great knowledge for. I appreciate that. Thank you. Moving on with my life, but you were talking about um the Count Basie big band. You know, we talked about Emmanuel Wilkins. So, how was that experience? You know, traveling. Yeah, I I know you said you were you had a many roles during that time so how was the count basic big band and writing arrangements for them and how nervous was it uh, uh writing arrangements when we like oh man is this good enough or did you have those moments right right so i had two seasons with the count basic orchestra with with like three years in the middle uh, i'll talk about the first one um so i'm fresh out of grad school and i had studied with a great trumpet player Derek gardner when i was at michigan right. state he was teaching there at the time great musician um Great trumpet player, great arranger, all that. He used to tell me stories about the Count Basie Orchestra all the time and touring with them. And it's funny, I always tell this story of how I remember I'm talking about being in Switzerland with a band and riding on a train and seeing the mountains. And I remember I used to always be like, man, I'll never do anything that cool. In my mind, I truly thought like I'll never do anything. And then I literally did exactly that. But um I had played the Detroit Jazz Festival with uh the, it was like a Detroit Jazz Festival Orchestra Rodney Whitaker I put together and Patty Austin was one of the guests and Mike Williams was playing um, was playing lead trumpet and mm -hmm. Mike Williams you know happens to live in Michigan great lead player and he was the lead trumpet player with the, with the bass orchestra at that time so remember Derek told me he's like hey when you play with Mike make sure you really get in there man you know you really really show him how good you are like you know you're a great section player so get under him play really strong don't be shy I was playing second so I was right next to him so I was like alright cool I'm, I'm gonna lean into it He's like, you never know. You might have the chance to do something with the bass orchestra. So I'm playing with Mike, and Mike, you know, loved my playing. We got along really well. And I was like, let's see. This was probably summer of 07, I believe. So 
I was like 23 at the time, if I'm not mistaken. Mm, gotcha. And uh, yeah, I asked Mike after, I was like, hey man, if something ever happens with the Basie Orchestra, I'd love to, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd love to play with you guys. He's like, ah, oh, they only use New York cats. So I thought it was over. I went with my tail between my legs and moved on with my life. A couple months later, I got a call from Derek. He's like, hey man, uh, Freddie Hendricks, great term player. Freddie Hendricks is on tour with Alicia Keys. He dropped out of the Basie Orchestra to go on tour and they, they need somebody dependable. And they asked me if I would do it. He's like, I'm too busy, but I told them they need to hire you. I was like, what? He's <laughs> like, yeah, I, I told them they, they need to, you know, they hire you. And uh, you're going to get a call. I was like, okay, very funny, Derek. How are you? How is everybody? He was dead serious. <laughs> Next thing I know, I get a call from the from the manager, D. Askew. Uh, I get a call from her, and she's like, yeah, Derek recommended you. We got a six-week tour starting in February. That was like February 2008. We got a six-week tour, and... um. How much do you want to get paid? And you need a black suit and a blue shirt. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I was like, do I need to audition? Oh, she said, well, Derek Gardner recommended you. No, you don't need to audition. <laughs> I was like, okay. And she's like, and also your tour is basically your audition. I'm like, okay, that's, I'm, I'm not nervous at all. So I just started studying all the records that, you know, Derek recommended, the roulette recordings, all the classic ones, you know. And um, I had asked her, I was like, hey, can you, you know, fax me the music or scan the music or whatever and send it to me and she never responded like i never got the sheet music so i was like okay i'll be playing third trumpet with the count basie orchestra so i had a few months to study up and like you know i knew i knew i could read i knew i could play in a big band like you know i've been doing that but um really wanted to learn the style i get on my first tour we get uh you know we get to the airport i meet all the cats it's it's cool everybody's being really nice and we get on the tour bus after we landed in our you know our first destination and i just like go in put my bags down and take a seat grant langford who's a good friend of mine now um uh he plays the airman a note now um he walks up to me he's like hey man uh <laughs> you're in my seat i'm like okay grant you know cool i know i just met you you guys are hazing me whatever that you know he's like no actually i'm i'm, I'm dead serious there's a sign seating uh your seat is <laughs> four four rows up from the back on the right side and so I go back, and that's like where I sat all the years on the fan. That was wow, like, that was like where I that was like my seat. Apparently, there you know historically there were some like relations in the band where like they had to keep certain people in certain places, you know, to keep the peace on on the bus, and it just kind of stuck over the years. Like, wow. So we go and we go to the hotel quickly, get dressed, and head over to the sound check for the first gig. And we get there and I'm like, okay, cool. I'm going to have an opportunity just like in college, right? You get to go through all the music. They're going to hold my hand through the process because I'm the new guy and everything's going to be okay. So all of a sudden they start calling out numbers. They're like, all right. No, not numbers. They start calling out titles. They're like, all right, corner pocket. Uh, the next setup is going to be uh, boat and swing. Then it's going to be this. And I'm looking. I'm like, hey, guys, this music is in an alphabetical order. There's numbers on here. I don't know the numbers. And so the guys are calling out the names of the songs and then somebody else is telling me the numbers. Like, Moulton Swing, number 30. Like, all right, uh, we got a uh, quarter pocket, 145. And I'm like, first of all, how do you remember that? Second of all, what? Like, what's going on? So I'm pulling out all the music, trying to get an order. They're like, all right, let's read down Hey Jim, 146. And by the way, these are real numbers. Like, if I'm not mistaken, I think I'm saying the actual numbers. Mm -hmm. Pull Hey Jim on. Hey Jim is the only chart in the entire Basie book that you read from the upper left-hand corner and go all the way to the lower right-hand corner and all is well with the world. It's like literally the only chart that's like that. So we read it down. There's no solos. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling confident. Everybody's like, oh yeah, yeah, you sound good, man. Yeah, yeah, good, good job, right? I'm like, all right, what are we going to rehearse next? I'm like, all right, guys, time for a break. Dinner time. See you at the show it. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, uh, uh excuse me? We're not going to play through the rest of the music? <laughs> Like, no, we got to eat dinner. <laughs> so I'm kind of freaking out. I'm going through the set and I'm like, all right, I don't see any solos. I'm cool. I mean, I can just read my parts down. What's the worst that could happen? It's not going to be the end of the world. So I'm, I'm going down, looking through the music really quick. I'm backstage looking over the music. We go, I barely ate anything. Next thing I know, I'm in my suit and my tie. And they're like, all right, ladies and gentlemen, introducing the world famous Count Basie Orchestra. And this sold out audience and it's like big theater and everybody's clapping and I'm like oh my god oh my god <laughs> <laughs> so we walk out and we get ready for the show and we like come out and the first song was Hey Jim the same song that I sound checked on so I'm like okay at least the first song I'm like I'm comfortable with and we read it down I'm like yeah yeah good, good, good job Chris everything's okay <laughs> we start reading down a couple songs 
there's a lot of handwritten notes or things that are crossed out or just changes in the music that is not reflected in the sheet music that you kind of pick up on, but nothing bad happened until we got to, to Lil Darlin. Now, if you guys are familiar with Lil Darlin, you know, every college band, every high school band has played it. Usually it's do, boop, do, 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 right? Great. So I'm thinking that's what it's going to be. I get my bucket mute ready. All of a sudden, no count off. All I hear is bling, dong, bling, dong, bling, dong, bling, boom, dong, beep, beep, And I'm just like, what on earth is happening? It is the slowest tempo that I've ever played in my life. And so exposed, everybody's playing so softly, but articulate, and they're 100 percent tight on every quarter note. And I'm sitting here just trying not to mess up, and I'm playing my part. And every once in a while, I do what they call step in a hole, where all of a sudden there's supposed to be silence. And you hear a little bit of third trumpet. I'm like, oh man, oh I'm sorry, guys, I'm sorry. We're playing through it. We get to this one phrase. I'll sing it at the fashion temple to, to not let this long story drag on longer. But we get to the to the part where it's like. Yeah. I'm like, okay, cool. I know that part. But when we play it, it's like and here's here's where it messed me up. Man, and it wasn't written on there. They changed it to a quarter note triplet. It's not even a quarter note triplet. It's not even fair to call it a quarter note triplet. It's disrespectful to quarter note triplets to call it. It's something else. It's like this laid back, just wild. And you got to keep in mind, there were no conversations about this. It just happened. It was just like, get in there, figure it out, or go home. And so I had to figure it out. So that was a little darling. Um, and they would laugh, like, you know, like, ah, get out of that hole, newbie. I was newbie for like a good year. Anyway, this is my favorite story to tell. This is my last Count Basie Orchestra story for, for this segment. Um, second half of the concert, we get done with the intermission. I'm like, that went pretty well. Little Darling was a little bit of a disaster, but I know the style now. I got it locked in. Cool. Let's just go finish this concert so I can like try to get some sleep tonight. We start playing Shiny Stockings. I'm like, oh man, it's a, it's a great tune. Shiny Stockings, you know, it's one of those college favorites. But I look at my part, I'm like, cool. Third trumpet, I'm safe. Fourth trumpet has the solo. Everything's good. We start playing the tune. Put the intro, got our cut mutes in. And now my friend, now friend, then he just wanted to torture me, Andre Rice, great trumpet player who I worked with for many years. He starts talking to me. Hey man, guess what? You got the solo. You gotta go up front. What? Yeah, man, go up front. So now it's we're in the second A. We're in the second half of the tone. I am sight reading the third trumpet part. And I'm looking over at the fourth trumpet part and trying to memorize the chord changes. I'm like, okay, two, five, two, five, two, five, one. Goes to the four, I got the three, six. And I'm trying to like sight read my part at the same time. Then we get to like the break and he kicks me. He's like, all right, go out front. Take my cut mute out. And I'm just like, I guess I'm soloing with the Count Bixi Orchestra on my first night. That's no big deal. Just, I'm just going to walk out there. And you know what? It went. And the solo, you know, I don't know. God knows what I sounded like, but I felt pretty good about it. But that was my first solo with the Bixi Orchestra. I was not prepared for it, but it was fine. And the cats were happy with it. And I basically did that for six weeks. And by the end of the six weeks, I knew the book and I was offered an official spot in the band. And uh, I don't really get nervous before performances anymore because there's no way I'll ever be that ill prepared. But I was at the same time I was prepared because, you know, I knew how to read. I knew how to vibe with people. But I had to have huge ears and I had to be ready, you know? Um, right. I had to be ready for whatever and just be adaptable and show up on time. And there's a lot of lessons that you learn from being in the world, in the real world, doing something the way that people actually do it, that hopefully your, you know, institutional education will prepare you for. But there's also a lot of things it can't prepare you for. And that's okay. 
you have to get you have to get out and live life and and get your feet dirty and fall on your face and play in the holes that that has to happen that was my long story it's a great story beautiful story that is so good <laughs> oh, no. man that's it awesome fun. it was very fun yeah i i uh, just couldn't imagine <laughs> Uh, you get so stressful. <laughs> get up there. <laughs> I'm 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 like je- like you know very impressed that you were able to do that, and also very impressed that that um the other trumpeter who was trumpet four was like being able to play and be like like in those tiny little moments. Oh man, the conversations we used to have on the bandstand, man, we would have full blown conversations back there quietly, like while in the middle of a song, and then still come in with our our, our part on time. It was, wow. uh, it's it's like nothing else. It's like nothing else, man. Years with them, and then on that first tour, I was feeling really bold. I had an arrangement of "Did You Call Her Today," which, if anyone has been to MSU or if anyone's played in any youth ensemble that Rodney Whitaker's directed, you've played my arrangement of "Did You Call Her Today," and um. Yeah, I actually brought that arrangement in and had the band read it down. And they're like, oh, yeah, it's pretty cool. It wasn't until I did an arrangement of Marcus Belgrave's All My Love um, that the director at the time, the late Bill Hughes, uh, really fell in love with that tune and, and that arrangement. And we started playing that one regularly. And I was just happy I had like a chart in the Basie Band book. And for a number of years, we played that. And then it wasn't until um, I was with the band for about three years took a break after my, my oldest son Bennett was born, took a three year break and then joined back in, you know, um, from what, like 2013 up until 2019. So, um, yeah. And then when I came back, there was definitely like a lot more opportunity to write. I wrote for a Christmas album that we did. I wrote quite a few arrangements for the all about that Basie album that we released. So, and I did some stuff like for some, you know, special shows and things of that nature. So I'd say at first it was really just like, read a chart, try some stuff, see what happens. But by the time I came back, um, I was a, a much more experienced arranger and it was kind of like built into what I was going to do, that there was going to be some writing opportunities and it felt pretty natural. There's also a lot of difference in age, you know, it was like, we're talking like, you know, my first tour, I was 24. And then when I came back to the band, I was like 30. So it's like, oh yeah, I've been here before. I've done this. But <laughs> What an honor to be a part of that legacy, you know? And every time I'd write anything for that group, it's always like respect the legacy. Respect mm-hmm. the legacy, be thankful for the opportunity, contribute to what, what has already been done, and bring some of yourself, but respect the legacy, you know? Right. Um, so kind of moving on to your music. Um, we the, the thing that's on your website, that one of the things that I personally found really fascinating was... Your your audio visual album safe, um, and uh, I watched it and I was like really really um, inspired by it because it was just so different than you know something that I would expect from being called like an audio visual album. You know because not only is it just like audio and visual, but it's also like it's hand drawn, um, mm-hmm. and then it's like. Yeah these scenes you know and it's almost like how you mentioned like when you were talking about the movie uh writing for movies and writing for films it's those moments where you are writing where there is no uh speaking there's only the the visual aspect of it so i i found that part really interesting and i was wondering if you could talk about you know how that idea came to fruition and you know some things that somebody just by looking at it wouldn't necessarily know about it yeah so um and thank you thank you for that um when i was really young before i was into music before i really got heavy into music i was uh i wanted to be a visual artist i I loved drawing and i would draw all the time and um just something i was really passionate about it was like a nice you know kind of like creative outlet escape as a kid um but i got away from it as i got really serious about music in high school i just kind of like left drawing alone and would very very rarely ever draw um it was um, during a time where uh, I was, you know, doing doing some just doing some therapy work, just trying to like find more balance and trying to to heal myself and you know and and become better. And it's something that I, I think is really important that we talk about. Like everyone, if you can, like try to find a great therapist and, and do some personal work. Um, just want to throw that out there. I think it's 
really, really useful. I wish more people had talked about it when I was coming up. I wish more people were transparent with that or aware of it. Um, right. It can help you out a lot, you know? Like, you, you, you go through all sorts of different professions and things with, with a coach. Like, having some sort of, like, life coach that can help you through things is important. But... What I found is that drawing became like a really nice way to express certain things that I was feeling and and going through or reflecting on in a way that words couldn't. And so I would, you know, just started using it as, as a way of just expressing like a particular topic that uh, I was dealing with, you know, in, in a therapy session and thinking about afterwards. And then these musical ideas just started to come um, to match it. The very first idea for safe was actually um i wanted to shoot like a little mini movie and the first sketch that i did specifically for safe was like supposed to be like a storyboard um to represent what i wanted the video to look like i was working with my, my good friend matt lima and he's like yo i think this is the movie <laughs> um and i just started experimenting with i you know I had never released anything. I'd never on any of my social media accounts, never professionally released any of my visual art. Cause it just was, you know, it was just like sketches, just stuff I was messing with, but it felt very personal. I felt very strongly about it. And, um, I started just experimenting with like animating some things and getting it to interact with the music. And it was very different. I, I did the music first, but then I found myself creating these, this imagery that now it's hard for me to imagine the music without the imagery that I created. And it just, it's kind of like one of those, like, yes, this captured what I was feeling in this moment. This adds on to the story in a, in a very valuable way. And it's also the first project that I've done besides a couple of film scores. It's the first project that I've done as an album where I produced and played all the instruments and, and did everything. Um, my good friend, Darrell Red Campbell uh, mixed it for me. Ooh, red. But other than that, like, I produced everything and I never released like my production stuff. Like I'll, you know, produce some stuff on a film, but that's like very different, but nothing with drums and stuff like that. But it was like, this is a personal story. This is like a, something that, that requires like a, a very different approach. And, um, it's very therapeutic. And honestly, it was one of those, like, however people decide to respond to this, like I need to do this for me and I want to put it out there. I hope it helps some people, I hope some people dig it. And I was actually amazed. Like the responses I got was like, really really encouraging a lot of people were really into it and um even without words even without a ton of description there were uh quite a few people who had like a very emotional and visceral reaction to it but that's kind of the point is that it's it's honest and i'd say that it's probably one of the most honest things that i've done and since then has affected the way that i approach everything in right. an attempt it's because it's not perfect the drawings are, are not like some perfect art i mean but what is perfect it's just honest it is, it's yeah. just real it's just exactly what it was supposed to be and i've been trying to adapt that into my art as much as possible now of just like this is what it is in this moment this is a snapshot of what i was feeling this isn't like i'm trying to create the next clifford brown with strings masterpiece this is just this is safe this is this song this is this piece of art and it's not trying to be perfect and make everything line up with the stars a certain way and just like release dope art. Mm -hmm. So that's what that's about. Yeah. I, uh, I especially enjoyed, um, I don't remember specifically where it was, but there was a, a silhouette sitting and there was a moon and you could see the stars moving. And I thought that was really, really cool because there was this kind of a uh, counter shift of, the stillness and then the stars moving. I don't know if that's something that was intentional for that specific thing to sure. see, but you know, I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, How did you, you get you. the things to move? Was that like still um, art or like, you know, what's funny is it's not, it's not like, it's not even that dramatic. Um, it's just like an app. Uh, I'm looking on my phone now. What's it called? Yeah. 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 There's these apps. One of them's called Motion Leap. The other one's called Video Leap. I think I used Motion Leap. And basically you can like add in these elements on top of like a, a still image mm. and like it'll like make stuff move. Or you can like draw in like a form and it'll like make it look like the water's moving. Mm. Um, and I'd seen like a, a ad for it. I was like, that looks, that looks cool. Let me try that over one of my drawings. I was like, oh, that's really cool. There was... A couple of them, like uh, the rise and fall of Bunny Man, and also um, 
what's it called? Uh, uh, open letter to the devil. Uh, both of those had like true animated elements where like everything you saw was actually like for real, um, animated. But, uh, I don't know. I didn't, I had no idea what I was doing. I just like, was like, I'm going to figure this out. I'm a nerd and nerds can figure anything out. So I'm just going to be nerdy about this and artistic about this and just figure out how to do it. And I started adding in different motion and I was like, that looks cool. And it took, it took a lot of pressure off. I got to say this idea of just kind of like, I'm not proclaiming to be anything except just somebody who's trying to express something. So I don't know. That looks dope. Let's do that. Let's make the head <laughs> right. and, and, yeah. and make the, the snare drum hit. And it was sweet. You know, I, I enjoyed myself. Um, a lot and it it freed me up because there was like a, a certain level of like you know not giving <laughs> any <laughs> in order to uh to make that and it was very freeing to like stop trying to be perfect i know i keep coming back to that but that's like a that's a it's a really important theme um that's a part of safe and a part of like kind of my life philosophy is this attempt to like you know do good and, and do good work but perfection is kind of off the table now whereas that there used to be a lot of pressure to try to be perfect but it's it's impractical and it's also not that interesting i think it's something that uh i feel a lot of young people including me myself right now it's just like you learn that there's no such thing as being perfect because nobody's nope. perfect and nope. you strive to be perfect and it's just like yeah you know you're never going to be perfect but you want to get damn near close and like the best person that you can be and you want to be the best person yeah, yeah. So, i feel like it's like a catchphrase gone wrong right you know? right right strive for perfection and they don't realize like you you say that to the wrong person who's already a perfectionist and right? they take that very literally and there's no room for mistakes um, it's just, it's incredibly unhealthy. Um, I think you should strive to be great. You should strive to be like the best that you can. You should work hard and, you know, have good morals and all those things, but like perfect. Eh. That's something very, very different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about Detroit. You're a Detroit native and man, it is. What do you think about the scene? What are your thoughts about the scene? I mean, there's so many fantastic musicians um, from this area, near this area, in this area that are just doing great things. Um, and I think Detroit, the benefit Detroit has always had is that it does not specialize in just one thing. Um, there is just a multitude of different styles, different tastes, different you know, types of groups, bands and soloists and DJs and techno and all sorts of stuff, gospel. Um, I just love that Detroit has a very distinct style in every single style, if that makes sense. If you hear like a rock group from Detroit, it's going to have like a Detroit flavor. You hear, uh, you know, if you hear like Detroit gospel has its own thing. So mm -hmm. honestly, I'm just, <clears throat> I'm constantly inspired. And I think the perfection thing, honestly, some of that comes from being from Detroit. There's so much great art, so many great musicians. It's really easy to get caught in like a comparison game especially if you're jumping between st styles, then it's like, man, there's this like amazing producer over here. And then I've got this amazing bass player over here. And I've got this amazing electric bass player over here, but just realizing you don't have to be like a master of all those things. You can, you can be inspired by that without having to like participate at that level. Um, but man, it, also Detroit has like some of the best audiences, like people that will let you know, I grew up going to jam sessions at Baker's keyboard lounge when I was in high school and they didn't care how old I was. They would let you know, like, you sounded bad. You, I really, I love that, you know, uh, any sort of emotions. You get, like, some, a very different level of, of crowd participation being in Detroit. Um, it's, uh, it's fantastic, man. And there's so much legacy. There's just so much legacy here. Um, and attention to detail. And there's a lot of passing of the torch. So, uh, yeah, Detroit. I'm, I'm very happy to be back here, too. Um, I spent, you know, quite a few years not only traveling, but also living in other places. And, you know, but all the while I was still mentoring in this community, even if it was from a distance, or even when I would come back, I'd make it a point to be involved in what was happening. Mm -hmm. But uh, to be here and to be living here is like everything. Mm. So it's really dope. I wish you know, I could go out and hear some music, but you know, <laughs> hopefully that'll change in the next year or so. Yes, please. It will. 
as well. Yeah, that'd be dope. <laughs> um, Meanwhile, man, people are like determined. Meanwhile, people are determined. They're still putting stuff out. They're they're doing live streams. They're recording, you know, material. Like art will not be stopped. It just changes platforms a little bit. That's all. Mm, I like that. Um, so another another question about Detroit. Um, uh, how has Detroit impacted your life? Hmm. Uh, I mean, I'm. I would say like I I was I was born in Detroit. I was raised in Southfield. And it was it was high school when I first started like regularly going into the city for like <clears throat> you know different youth organizations as well as like just like I said going to Baker's Keyboard Lounge in different places. Um, and there's a certain like I think just realness and rawness that you know academia or suburban life <laughs> doesn't necessarily afford you of just like this like real raw honesty and raw energy. And um, just like the people, you know, the interaction with the people, the experience of uh, having the responsibility of making music that people can mesh with, seeing how people react to it, seeing the, the, the diverse amount of characters that you see in an audience or even, you know, outside of venues, um, seeing the graffiti, seeing like the, the architecture. Um, it just has like a really inspiring feel and it has its own like kind of swag and um i think for me the ability to wear multiple hats the ability to be um to strive to be as genuine as possible and also just having to be on top of your stuff there were just so many opportunities that um highlighted all of those important characteristics that were like a, a central part of my my upbringing so um I would say it gives you tough skin. It'll, it'll eat you up and chew you up a little bit. But also, too, there are so many great mentors and so many great offerings that there's kind of something for everybody. And there's a lot of, like, cross-genre respect. Um, that was kind of a struggle when I was in college a little bit. You know, there was, like, a bit more separation. Mm -hmm. I'd say at the collegiate level of, like, oh, well, this, this is music or this is art or this is... But in Detroit, it's just kind of like, I don't know. I, I went to a a concert that civic youth uh the civic youth orchestra was doing and omar butler a good friend of mine was a uh, was like a featured soloist he was studying at juilliard at the time i remember marcus belgrave sitting there in the audience and he's just loving this orchestra and just loving this orchestra piece and the way he interacted with the orchestra piece was completely different than the way that like your general orchestra like audience member would but it was like it was all love it was all music it was all art um and that's there's just something very pure about that and like a very pure perspective on the way that art is consumed. Mm -hmm. Just, just yeah. magnificent right there. Just freaking magnificent. Um, kind of all your experiences you've been talking about. What are some defining experiences? You can e either name the ones that you've already experienced, or what were some experiences in your life that defined who Chris Johnson is? Um. I would say music was a place, was like the first place where I really felt like, you know, I grew up, like I think a lot of people did, like having a longing to belong to something. And, you know, it's kind of like art, but that's kind of like a loner culture in some ways, you know, at that <laughs> time, like, you know, you just go off in a corner and go draw somewhere. Uh, I tried basketball. I was really bad at it, but I was tall, so they tried to give me a shot, but then it didn't work. Um, but there was like a sense of community, and in music and in in, in theater and like the whole art swing, the G wing <laughs> at uh, South Lathrop High School, and it was kind of like you know a bunch of like weirdos like playing instruments and making music and being dramatic and like doing. I used to go. I used to just like go sit and watch people do like. Uh, improv theater like in high school like those are the type of people i went to high school with and like doing musicals it was like the sense of community and this sense of like the same way in which i think a lot of people kind of disappear in their head and go to another place and like you know fantasize about things or like you know read a good book or watch a good movie and kind of disappear into it or like role play mm -hmm. or cosplay or whatever people are into but like music and like theater and art that's kind of that's like 
our job is to create that. So it's kind of like a behind the scenes look at like something that is so incredibly therapeutic and immersive, except you're, instead of just listening to it, you're actually experiencing it. So I'd say that's like pretty transformative Mm -hmm. is to want to be a part of that. And it's easy to lose sight of that. I think everybody needs to come back to like the original reasons why they participated in art in the first place. And for me, a large part of it was like, it was an opportunity to be a part of something that was much bigger than myself and to belong to something that could make a huge difference. And a lot of the experiences were getting over the fact that I didn't know what I was doing yet and kind of trusting the process and, and hitting those milestones to be able to actually participate in that at, at any level. Right. Um, seeing the kindness from, from different musical, uh, you know, mentors, uh, Damian Crutcher, my high school band director, just the amount of um, investment that he made into me uh, looking, you know, Marcus Belgrave and, and Wendell Harrison, Harold McKinney uh, later on Wycliffe Gordon, who I met outside of the village Vanguard one night, my first time going to New York city. And I introduced myself to him and he gave me his card. It was like, call me tomorrow. I don't have enough time to talk to you right now. Cause I'm catching a cab, but please call me. Cause I want to talk to you more. And I'm like, why does he care? <laughs> but he did. And I called him the next night. He's like, oh yeah, you should come down to the Village Vanguard. I'm playing. I'm sorry. I met him outside the Knitting Factory. He's like, you should come down to the Village Vanguard. I'm playing with Eric Reed. And like, I'm like sitting in front row. And after the set, he's like talking to me. And it made me realize like, wow, this is like one of the most brilliant musicians in the world. He's like a really good person and cares a lot about investing in even just the time that knows the impact that him taking the time to like talk to this high school kid about music will have. Um, and now we're like, you know, like good friends and I'm his copyist. I've been his copyist for like the last 10 years. And, uh, again, it, it doesn't change. Like he's just a great person. So I think the pivotal things have just been seeing the impact that music can have and also seeing the type of people that create and how you can hear the type of people. Um, you can hear what type of person someone is a lot of times in their music. And, uh, to me, I want my music to represent, you know, who I am or who I want to be or you know, what message I'm conveying in that moment. Definitely. Right. Uh, To carry on that, um, what are some of your more memorable gigs? You mentioned the Count Basie one, but what are some ones that you, like, that are very memorable to you? Um, I had an opportunity to bring my band out and bring out some really dope vocalists and actors to uh, Salt Lake City when I was uh, director of jazz studies there and perform my musical Jim Crow's Tears. And that was just like this incredible experience of having a a lot of local musicians from Utah that I got to know, and as well as like, you know, vocalists and actors from you know New York and from Chicago and my band from Detroit come in and we're all on stage like performing this musical that I wrote. And um, you know, the the my uh, Gary Anderson, fantastic, brilliant playwright and head of Plowshares Theater. He um he wrote the book and he came out and directed the actors. I had Gil Ashby, a fantastic visual artist, kind of create like a backdrop of original art. That was just like a really really special performance, um, really really special moment. Another one that jumps out to me was a, a battle of the bands between the Count Basie Orchestra and the Lincoln Center Jazz Orchestra at a Symphony Center in uh, Chicago. And it's like you got both big bands like Ooh. set up side by side on stage and we're going back they're playing the music of duke ellington we're playing the music of count basie and it was just like ugh, it was ridiculous it didn't feel like a competition it just felt like a beautiful exchange until lincoln center played bragging and brass and then it became a competition and then we lost but other than that it was like a really just beautiful exchange of music um and just to like look over and it's like yeah there's ryan kaiser and marcus printup and you know, and, and when Marcellus and like, uh, and, and all these guys, and it was just, uh, it was a beautiful moment, man. And it was like really, truly like a, a musical conversation. And, uh, I grew up, you know, like watching recordings at Lincoln center and looked up to, so it's all those guys. And so to be on stage and kind of be like, yo, like that's the legacy of Duke Ellington. This is the legacy of Count Basie. And like, we're all participating in it. It's pretty phenomenal. Yeah. That's, that's so awesome. That's that's pretty next level, honestly. Like two bands, I've never I've never heard. Is that even like a common thing? I'm really fascinated if that's ever happened before. It when, used to be. It used to be a really common thing, like at like swing dances and stuff, or just different concerts. Like battle of the bands were like huge. Mm-hmm. I've got a poster down here. It's like 
there's a local group called the McKinney Cotton Pickers, and it was like a battle of the bands with like the local Detroit <clears throat> swing band and uh, and the Duke Ellington Orchestra. That used to be like a thing, you know. Wow. Um, doesn't really happen nearly as much, I guess. Like, uh, essentially, Ellington in New York is like the closest thing to that now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was dope. It was that I did another one. It was uh, the Gerald Wilson Orchestra and the Count Basie Orchestra. We played the Detroit Jazz Festival. That was pretty dope too. Mm-hmm. Man. I actually remember watching that video and it's just the reaction that the just the bands next to each other and you guys reactions back and forth. You're just like, whoa, oh, oh, just wild because wow. it, cause it's not really a competition because we're all like fans of each other and everybody checking each other out and just like and just loving it. You know, mm. it was a uh, it's pretty phenomenal, man. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> right. Um. Going on to uh, more of an educational standpoint, um, what are some teaching strategies that you have for other music teachers and people in art? I would definitely say, like, consider the, the, the level of where your musical student's at and where they're trying to go. Um, I think oftentimes, and I know I was like this when I first started teaching <clears throat> early on in, uh, like, you know, late high school, early college, I treated every student <clears throat> Forgive me. I treated every student as if they were trying to like become the next Roy Hargrove. Like it was like so serious. It was like, no, you're gonna learn this scale, learn it on twelve keys in one week, the way I did, and you're inside read this, and and you gotta go listen to this record. And it was like this really intense process that I had adopted because that's how I felt about the music. Some of these kids didn't want to be musicians. Some of them just wanted to like learn the trumpet because they thought it was cool and it was something fun to do and if they had to pick an extracurricular activity it was play trumpet it took me a long time to understand that i think for the longest time it was like just like this real elitist um snobby uh uh you know musical purist jazz purist mindset um unfortunately those are the dark years but um <laughs> After a while, what I noticed is like what my students would really benefit from was like the conversations we would have. It was way more about mentorship. It was way more about like showing kids how they could like believe in themselves and showing them like through some hard work or through some discipline, they could have fun and learn something and accomplish something. And it started to like calm down. And it also helped me a lot artistically. And it was like, okay, this student, you know, went on to become an accountant. This was teaching, you know, for a long time. So I've seen like my students do many things. Like, oh, this student's a IT developer. This student is a doctor. This is this student's a musician. Like, across the board, <clears throat> across the board, you saw different things. But like, they benefited from what we talked about because it all had universal concepts. So right. if teachers can hone in on universal concepts of like. This is how you build pride and like taking pride in something and working towards something and feeling good about it. This is how you can like feel good about yourself. This is like how you can express yourself through a different medium. I think those are the things that are really impactful for teachers to focus on. And then from there, if someone happens to want to continue on to be a professional musician, then all those things still work. Just the discipline looks differently. I'm going to set a reasonable goal. If I'm working with one student who I know doesn't have that much time to practice, it's like, okay, cool. You know, practice for 15 minutes a day. Great. Some people's like, no, it's got to be six hours of practice a day. You got to be serious about this. You got to wake up before school the way I did. And <laughs> no, you don't. Cause that's, that's Bobby. I'm Chris. Bobby's not going to do things the way that Chris did. And that's like totally fine, but you made a commitment to do this lesson. So Whatever we decide on, you're going to do at least that much practice between this week and next week. And the students got a lot out of it. And then from there, if they want to nurture that into something deeper, that's cool. We've got the blueprint set, the infrastructure of discipline and expectations and meeting those expectations and, and setting goals and realizing those goals is there. Then, you know, young people can do whatever they want. They really have an opportunity to like live and live their life instead of like feeling pressures of like what I think they should do or try to live my life vicariously through them. Instead, it's just like, a, no, I'm doing this for myself. I'm doing this and I have pride in this and it makes me feel good. To me, like that's like, that's the real key. I just want to help people like feel good about themselves, have some discipline and understand how that can, you know, 
help them in life and help them to reach more happiness. Because it's about happiness. It's about success. It's about health. So that's my advice for educators. Definitely. Um, how, how would you, uh, well, you know, we, 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 did, we, we mentioned that, uh, or you mentioned that uh, there's no one size fits all. There's no pathway. But one right. thing that we noticed is that you're very, you've done so many projects. And it's really inspiring for us and I'm sure for many other people. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, starting a project and getting it somewhere? And I guess another thing is staying committed to that project because obviously, you know, you can start something, but then sticking to the end is a whole nother thing. Yeah. And I did a video about this recently, about realizing your goals um, on my office hours platform. Uh, to me, the, basically, here's the steps. Let's say, like, I start at the top of my list, and I get as like global as possible, like as large as possible. At the top of my list, it's I want to write a big man chart and make a video and release it. Cool. Then from there, it's just like breaking it down. Say, like, okay, cool. Uh, what are the things that I need to do? That well, I need to pick a song. I need to arrange that song. I need to find musicians to record it. I need to edit the video. I need to edit the audio. I need to mix it. I just like start making a list of steps. Each one of those is like its own category. Then say, like, okay, arrange the song. Well, what does that mean? Let me break that down to its like smallest instance. In order to arrange the song, I need to open finale and create, make sure I have my template open. I need to decide the tempo. I need to decide the style that I want. I need to like reharm the sections I want to reharm. Okay, great. What do I do from there? I need to orchestrate the A section. I need to like orchestrate the B section. I need to uh, format the parts you start breaking things down into milestones and then assign dates then it's just a matter of like within this global template of everything that i need to do like write things down and just say cool i want to have this done in a month if i work backwards what are what, what's the step that i need to take in week one two three and four okay within week one what are the steps that i need to take daily okay within that day what are the steps that i need to take hourly Within that hour, what are the steps I need to take? And just really getting detailed, not, not to get weighed down with the planning process, but to put something down on paper and then go for it. And then adapt when it doesn't work out because it's never going to work out. Cool, I need to have the first A section done by the end of the day. I didn't finish it. How far did you get? I got like 75%. Okay, start off tomorrow a little bit earlier than you planned. Finish that 25%. Dive into the next section. And be solution oriented. And man, there's something so addictive about check boxes. Just create like a note in your phone. You put that little circle, you can put the check on, and it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, I did that. Cool. I even do that like, with big bands. It's like I'm waiting for people to submit recordings. I have a, a list that I refresh, and it's like, okay, Alto One turned in his part. Thank you, Caleb. Okay, what's next? Send that to all of the saxophone sections. Ooh, Trumpet One turned in his. Check. Send that to the trumpets. And then as they do theirs, I check them off. There's something so satisfying about list and check marks. So let's say make a big vision and a big plan. And then slowly start to flesh it out and assign times so and you can do things and be patient with yourself when you don't realize those goals, but have a list so you can come back to it and refocus. When you get frustrated, it's like, okay, I don't feel like arranging this right now, but what I should do is at least like, you know, hire the musicians or like lock in the musicians. Like, man, I'm not really feeling that inspired to like write this shout section. Oh, well, I could create my mock-up and logic and like pull that in. So when you have a large list like that, you can start to kind of address things that you're in the right spirit or the right mind frame to do and always make progress even when you don't feel like doing one particular task. Hmm. Yeah, I'm taking that to heart because, okay, yep, mm -hmm. moving on. <laughs> what is something that you uh, will never forget and that you constantly um, refer back to? So it will be your quote or a concept that you want to know and you want people to know a quote or a concept i love i'll go i'll, I'll pick a movie because i love a lot of things through movies but i will specifically say um the pursuit of happiness with happiness spelled wrong um it's just a fantastic film for so many reasons but i really loved like he just kept messing up he was trying he was trying to do the right thing and he just kept like either having something bad happen to him or just effing up like on his own. But I love the message of he wasn't perfect, right? 
Mm-hmm. He wasn't doing everything right, but he was trying. He was working hard. He wasn't taking care of himself, and he should have taken care of himself. He'd mess up with his son sometimes. There was all sorts of... But at the end, it was kind of like his arc, the arc that he was on, led him. It led him towards like a certain amount of success, and it was kind of like, uh, okay, a lot of stuff is going to happen in the middle, but you just kind of keep going. And then I'm sure... After the, you know, after the credits rolled, like whatever happened in real life, I'm sure he made more mistakes, right? <laughs> I'm sure he did more things. But the idea was kind of like, instead of it being perfection, there were just so many things, so many things that he had to overcome and to focus on. But there was always the redirect. Okay, all right, my card just got confiscated. I'm going to redirect in this way. I re- redirected in a really poor way. I'm going to redirect in this way. I'm going to try this. It was like, man, Bobbin. You know, sticking and moving, just trying out different stuff. And I think that's like a really important life lesson and something to adapt is just be adaptable. Be ready for change. Take on change. Try out different stuff. Fall on your face. Learn from from all those things, you know? Mm -hmm. What are some things or hobbies you do that are not music affiliated? (laughs) What? (laughs) Uh, video editing, <laughs> which is like very recent, but that, I can't call that a hobby because I get paid to do it. But that's been really cool. I've been getting a lot of freelance work, like putting together multi-frame video performances for people. So that's cool. Um, I love playing with my kids, Bennett and Jonah. They're awesome. We play Connect Four and Uno. Uh, we used to play Smash Bros a lot, but they got into Minecraft, and I just can't. I just can't. I tr- I tried. What? I really tried. But, you don't uh, like Minecraft? Ah, look, man. <laughs> Come on. Right. It's not. They would be laughing. Down. They actually, they would have been laughing at um, how badly I struggled to log into Discord this morning because they use Discord <laughs> sometimes. Uh, that they, they would have found that really funny. But no, honestly, um, spending time with them, spending time like just hanging out, kicking it with <clears> them. Uh, Lulu and I spending quality time together, and just like. Shutting down the devices and just like cooking a great meal together, hanging out, watching a movie, like yeah, going out. I just I love family time. I love my my family unit here. It's pretty pretty amazing. And honestly, when I'm not making music or doing that, I'm just kicking it with them, and they're just like hilarious, awesome people, and we have adventures together, and it's great. Hmm, nice, that's, that's good old adventures. Thing. I I'm still I'm still hurt from the Minecraft, but it's okay. Uh, I, I will say I tried, but if it makes you feel better, they both have their own iPad. They both have their own switch. All of those have Minecraft on them. They have a server that they build with their cousins. I'm very supportive of their Minecraft habit. I'm glad. I'm, I'm glad. I just personally struggle with the participation, but I will facilitate it. Dom and I, I have facilitate. had this conversation before where I'm just like, man, I just can't play it. Uh, and he's like, no, you have to. You have to give it a chance, you know? It's one of those interesting... I tried. It's one, of the, it's one of those interesting things just about Minecraft really quick is that it's like one of those games where it's like, even though like me and, you know, Chris, for example, mm-hmm. like it's still one of those games that like, it's not like, no, but not everybody can play it. It's like one of those games that everybody can play. You know, if you're like... Or- you can't have every single person play like okay, okay, Grand okay, Theft okay, Auto, okay, 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 okay. but you can. You, like Minecraft is one of those games where you can definitely have like. <laughs> I can tell this is a sore subject. Okay, um, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> so, 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 like, just hear me out. Just the both of you. Just hear me out. In Minecraft, I, the reason I love it so much is because you can continue to build like new things. So, like, right. My friends, they just hit me up. They're like, hey, we're starting up a Minecraft. So I'm like, uh, I don't really want to get into it because I'm going to get really into it. So I got into it. And like, I'm like, oh, I love the way it hits my creativity of my mind. Like the way I can think about new things like, oh, I'm going to make an extension to my house. And that's going to be like the area where I do that specific thing. And then I kind of translate, it all translates to like, oh, I'm, I'm like playing music and I'm like, oh, I'm going to add a little area over here so the saxes can get down, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so what I'll say, what I'll say is I share, I, I harbor no judgment <laughs> in the way that someone chooses to uh, pursue their creativity. 
And I only ask that the same um, lack of, of judgment is applied to myself. Yes. That patience is exercised for my lack of interest in that boring, I mean, in, in that game. That <laughs> of, course, of course, of course, of course. No, no, no. Um, I, this is going to sound really stu- like silly, but I'm constantly building musical worlds <laughs> every single day. So I think maybe I'm just burnt out on having <laughs> things from scratch and organized things that when I'm stacking bricks together to make a house, I'm like, okay, yeah, sure, but guys, I gotta like, I gotta like put this, I gotta like put these musicians in boxes and like make a dope video. I don't have the energy to, <laughs> to, to put now. more boxes on top of boxes. Right. right. I totally. We, we did that for a long time. I'll get. I, I promise I'll give it another shot. But each time I'm like, okay, this is cool for about five minutes. I'm just happy they're happy. You know. Yeah. Just find That's the game that. that you love. I, I'm joking. <laughs> but um, we want to move on to uh, our signature um, section. It's called Hip the Listener. This is where we have you, the guests, hip the listeners to anything, whether it be music, art, events, movies, documentaries, whatever you want. Hip the Listener. Okay. Uh, like you're looking for like a list or one. Oh, no, no, no. You can pick one, one thing. thing. You can pick five things. However, okay. you want to go. Um, great. Uh, shows. Let's start off with shows. Cool. Uh, Lovecraft Country. Watchmen. Dark. Yeah, definitely those three. Okay. I was limited to three. I'll limit myself to three in each category. Sure. Uh, Watchmen, Lovecraft Country, and Dark are like three really, really dope shows that everybody should get into. Uh, music. Moses Sumney, if you're not already hip. Uh, Tom Brown, who had a huge influence on me as a trumpet player. Um, it's like 80s smooth jazz funk, but Tom Brown is like the most soulful person on trumpet ever. <laughs> um, what else in terms of music? Dave Matthews Band. Don't sleep on Dave Matthews Band because they're amazing, particularly um, before these crowded streets. Just like... Yo, amazing. Like, you'll hear it and be like, oh, I understand Chris so much more now because he listens to Dave Matthews, man. So does my drummer, Nate Wynn. He's a big fan of Carter Buford. Um, yeah. What were the other categories? You, you want more? Oh, yeah. Anything. Musicals. Yo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Musical, th- musical theater. Let me tell you something. Wicked John Dixon, of all people, got me into the musical Wicked. The you music in stop. that is incredible. Just absolutely incredible. Like, do yourself a favor and get into that because it's really dope. Um, I love Ragtime. The the musical Ragtime is really cool. Um, I've seen like a lot of like random musicals because my fiance is an actress and she's been in a lot of musicals. There was a musical she did off Broadway that's now what well, was on Broadway called uh, Hades Town, which is really, really fantastic and worth checking out. Um, yeah. Go eat Indian food because it's delicious. Mm. <laughs> I think that's yes. all I got <laughs> for right now. Michigan has some but good Indian my... food. Indian man, there's this place in Farmington. Yeah, oh, you already know. You already know. You already know. <laughs> which one? Which one? Which one? Which one? Uh, do you, uh, is it Krishna? You know what? Indian flavors for me. Dude. Oh, okay. I know, I know the owners. Say really, yeah. How was that? So okay. Indian flavors, man. That yeah. joint is amazing. Yeah, I dude, love it. Yeah, man. I uh, so they actually the owners, one of the owners, uh, used to work out at the gym I worked at like oh, years snap. ago. So yeah, and that place was literally right across the street. So we'd work out and we'd go eat, and then we would it's like so good go home and immediately pass out because we ate so much. It's so good. It's so good. <laughs> it's like a, it's like shameful how good it is. Yeah. It's, really quite wonderful if you do want to try another one try gift of india it's pretty good okay i'll check it out um it's gonna be hard to tear me away from uh from india oh yeah (laughs) oh yeah i will i got you i got you so this is our last section uh okay wanna just kind of like spice it up we're gonna do some rapid fire questions uh, but they don't have to be rapid fire answers um, okay, I got you. I'm really good at that. I talk a lot. If you didn't notice that, already, so. <laughs> that's good for our podcast because Go it. it gives us like. <laughs> uh, so, the first rapid fire question is: 
Favorite ensemble slash project to write for? Big Ben. Boom. If you had a billboard anywhere in the world, where would it be and what would it say? If I had a billboard anywhere in the world, where would it be and what would it say? Um... I think a billboard in the middle of Detroit, uh, I don't know, that says, I don't know. That's a heavy one. Hold on. I feel like, like so much pressure to make a good answer right now. Uh, but like, I feel like a message to the city of Detroit of <laughs> you, you are dope and you're at the center of culture, whether you realize it or not. Shoot. Nice. Okay. I like that. Top three arrangers. Oh, that's easy. Uh, Thad Jones, Duke Ellington, Frank Foster. Awesome. And by Duke Ellington, I mean Duke Ellington slash Billy Strayhorn, just being real. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. yeah. What does your morning routine look like? <laughs> um, there, There's the one that I've designed and do sometimes. Then there's the one that I actually do. Usually it's like drink a big thing of water, make some coffee, maybe possibly some cereal and then go sit at my desk and start working feverishly at things before people wake up. But like on a morning like this morning, I actually got up and worked out and then sat down at my desk and feverishly worked at things until people woke up. Um, but yeah, it usually involves some sort of work. It's supposed to involve meditation and a workout. Uh, that's less frequent. Rapid fire. Go. <laughs> um, flugel horn or trumpet? Oh, if I actually had to choose, I would probably give up my trumpet and play flugelhorn because I love it. I just love it so much. Um, and it'd be dope to be different. Mm. Yeah. Top three film scores. Top three film scores. Yes. Uh, Malcolm <clears throat> X, Spike Lee and Terrence Blanchard. Um, absolutely incredible. Black Panther, Ludwig Garrison. Um... I'm trying to get like everybody in there. <laughs> uh, I'd say, what was the, which which one of the Dark Knight movies had a uh, Heath Ledger in it? Second one was that? Yeah, yeah, the second. The Dark Knight. Yeah, it was just called the Dark Knight. Yep. Yeah, Hans Zimmer. I love all three of those. Mm. Is there anything else you want to leave with the audience? Man. Subscribe to this podcast because these guys are awesome and they oh ask really good God. questions. Oh, and do the you guys are great. It. You guys are dope. Yeah. Thank you. Because well, real quick, have we met in person before? No, I don't think so. I've. I was always gonna say I don't. I don't think so. You, and it's crazy yeah. because I was. Um, I had posted my Instagram thing of like a, a arranging project that I was doing in arranging two, and then Red said. You need to talk to Chris Johnson. And I was just like, who's Chris Johnson? And then I went on That's your Instagram. Wild. I was just like, yo, he's like doing exactly what I want. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you hit me? Wait, wait, why don't you hit me up, man? I would have helped you out, you know? Uh, oh, I'm just uh, now you can. Yeah, now I can. <laughs> it's nice to officially. Okay. Meet I want you. It, <laughs> I didn't have like a proper like uh, what do you say? I wanted to hit you up when I like wanted to hit you up. I got you. Cause That's fair. like, what I'll say too is like, always take the opportunity. Just like, even if I don't have anything important to say, like say what's up to these artists and people that you, you know, are checking out. Cause like, we're all just people and most of us manage our own accounts. It's not like we're like, you know, freaking, I don't know, Regina King or something where we need somebody to like, <laughs> manage our stuff for us and there's like this like barrier no we're like super accessible and we love hearing from people and, and connecting I'm always yeah, i don't so know if you guys noticed like you were, when you sent me an email i replied right i was like yeah that sounds great i don't even know who you are i didn't even ask you guys i wasn't like oh yeah well what's the show about i was like mm. a podcast about detroit i'm in let's go yeah so i feel like that's like the case with with most people mm. you know they just want to connect with dope people definitely well we we really appreciated you uh coming on the show um of course and we want to make sure that people know more about you so if you can tell the people where they can find you that would be awesome 
Yeah, if you're a person that still goes to websites, which means you're born before a certain year, then you can find me at chrisjohnsonmusic.com. Chris is spelled K-R-I-S. Most of you probably will not go to my website, so if you want to follow me on Instagram or Facebook, it's just Chris Johnson Music. Once again, Chris spelled K-R-I-S. And um, I also have an educational series, Office Hours with Chris Johnson.com, or on Facebook and Instagram, it's simply Office Hours with Chris. And uh, we post stuff like every day, basically just trying to help people out in their musical journeys and uh, have a couple products for sale too on like theory and practicing and video production for like a, a remote band and all that stuff and, yeah uh, yeah and don't be afraid of the dms hit people up hit me up yeah. say hello it's all good i love connecting with people and i just like being helpful and making dope art that's my life yeah i would definitely hit up more people and definitely hit you up because like i was just like oh maybe maybe he doesn't want to talk to me <laughs> he's so big he was in the count basie big band he, he he has other things to worry about you know I, that's funny but that's, you know, that's how i feel generation. about red pretty much but that's how i feel about red so that's funny you say that because like red is like you know that's red is like this brilliant musician i've known him red and i were in civic jazz together in 2000 wow. so i've known red for over 20 years he's he's and such a nice one guy of my best friends beautiful great musician but like we're all like we're all the same in that regard like mm. we're all cut from the that same is, what i don't even know the saying that is so same crazy. cloth mm. whatever it is but, yeah yeah you guys are dope you know, thank you for being on the show and just before we get off um you've known red since like 2000 because red has known me since I was like four. Oh, because he okay. would play in my dad's bands at the church. Um, it was either Red or Snoop or um, yeah, who else? But all these people, I'm just like, what? Red goes to Wayne? What? Red? 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 I'm just like, and then you know him, and it's just like everyone just knows everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah man we're listen man we're all we're all just humans trying to be dope and trying to do dope things um, and you guys are more successful at that red is more successful at being dope than anybody else that i know but uh you know yeah sounds like love. we gotta have him on the podcast i think so oh man are you kidding so. he's, the best, he's the best dude yeah that would be super awesome the, man it'd be good to the see the best him. dude but chris yeah. you have a wonderful day and i hope you, you guys have, too you keep you keep being you I, I have no choice and uh there's something exciting coming up soon so just I'll I'll do one of those like very vague uh stay tuned cuz I have really exciting news that you know hopefully people will find as exciting as I think it is. If you so. if you send us like those stay tuned things and stuff that you're going to post, we'll post it on all of our social media and promote it like crazy. Sweet. It's some 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 dope stuff so you'll enjoy it. All right, we're excited. Right. You take care. All right, thanks guys. Take care. Have a good we'll rest of your night. Have a good one. W-A-W-I-D-Y Wow, that was such a magnificent conversation. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe on all our social media. And we hope to see you soon.